Okay, so so that everyone's oriented, this will be the third last lecture. The next lecture, so next week will be about um, Zergel biomodules, how to understand the Hecker category via Zergel biomodules. And the last lecture, I will try to say some words about um, Bezrel Kavnikov Yun and um, the proof of Bezrel Kavnikov's theorem. Uh, so the last lecture will be very much overview. Um, this lecture will be two, but I just, I want to kind of, for the first hour, I want to give some um, nice calculations and be reasonably explicit about what um, Whittaker functions and Whittaker sheaves are. And in the second hour, I'll go into um, high speed mode. So um, Whittaker sheaves and the bezel coming So this is um, Whittaker plus archibald bezel kavnikov theorem. That's this lecture. Um, and to repeat something that's happened a few times, I want to start off with a very simple example, which I find very beautiful. Um, so just want to recall, so if we have um, n, so before we do the example, I just need a tiny bit of notation. So if we have n acting on x, so this is an algebraic group, we have the um, constructible derived category of x. I'm thinking at the moment that these are complex algebraic varieties, but we could, for example, be working in the Atal world. And we have n equivariant sheaves on g, on x. And we have two functors of averaging, so we have averaging n star and averaging n shriek, and these are defined by basically smearing out your sheaf. So um, average n star is defined to be, uh, if we have the following diagram, We have the multiplication map and the projection map. We take our sheaf and we form the um, box product with the constant sheaf on n times x. We shift this so that it's perverse. So we shift it down by we, we shift, shift this to be um, exact for the perversity structure. And then we push it forward by a star. And then we have averaging n shriek, which is the same thing except we push it forward by a shriek. And this is the same thing as saying uh, we do m lower star of p upper star shifted by dim n. And it's also the same thing as saying that we do m lower star of p upper shriek shifted by dim n. So roughly what we're thinking is we're just kind of integrating along the group to make our, our sheaf um, equivariant or averaging along the group. Uh, just some quick remarks about properties. Um, so the jewel of the star averaging is the shriek averaging. We have a junctions uh, For basically, I think you should think about the an averaging functor as basically being a push forward and, and forgetful functor as being a pullback. And so forgetful functor is left adjoint um, as a shift here, minus dimension, is left adjoint to star averaging and Shriek averaging is it's um, shriek averaging is left adjoint to the forget. 
Uh, so there's a question. Yes. Ah, uh, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. So here we need a minus. Uh, so we have these adjunctions and um, M is affine. So this implies that averaging N preserves the left wing of the T structure and averaging N, N shriek preserves the right wing of the perverse T structure. Uh, and the final remark is that this is a special case of induction restriction functors. So generally, this is the case of induction restriction for the trivial group, but if I have a pair of subgroups, I can in, do induction restriction. CF Bernstein ones. Okay, so this is all just formal. Uh, now I can give um, the fun calculation. I have to say that there's very few things in, in math that give me as much pleasure as these little calculations with perverse sheaves. So here's another, another example of this. So I want to take um, N to be the upper triangular, strictly upper triangular matrices acting on X, which is P1 of C. So this is the setting. And remember that PN, so perverse sheaves that are N equivariant, essentially because N is a unipotent group, is the same thing as P B, so B constructible. So generally imposing equivariance for a group is kind of extra structure. And this is always the case unless your group is unipotent and then being equivariant is just a property. And we'll see many instances of this in this lecture. Um, so now we know that there's five, so we've discussed this by now about three or four times, there's five indecomposable objects in PB. So there's five, there's five indecomposable, um, so here's our picture of X. Here's B mod B, which is zero. Up here is infinity. Um, and our stratification only allows singularities at the origin. And there's five indecomposable perverse sheaves. So there's IC identity. So I'll draw the following diagram, which indicates where there's maps. So we have a standard sheaf, so this is a shriek extension, a star extension. This surjects onto ICS. This includes the kernel is IC identity. And then, so these four are kind of the easy ones, and then you have the tricky one, which is the, the big projective aka the tilting module, the, the, the big tilting module. Um, and we have
constructions for IC identity, ICS. So there's, there's functorial constructions of these sheaves. But remember when I was discussing the fact that the category of highest weight, the category of perverse sheaves for an affine stratified variety is highest weight, I was trying to emphasize this point that the projective objects are constructed by some algebraic procedure by kind of killing X. And it's very um, desirable to have some kind of geometric construction of the projective. So what about And we'll see this um, beefed up in when I discuss um, Bezel Kamnikov Yun in two weeks. So, what Bezel Kamnikov Yun explained is a kind of geometric way of producing all tilting sheaves. Uh, okay, so now the claim is the claim, so this is the fun calculation. Remember this sheaf that I was calling X shriek Y star. So this is, I choose two points. So I choose two points X, Y not equal to zero. And then I basically um, shriek extend over X and star extend over Y. So this is from, um, so Masood asks, is the fact that uh, this, is it obvious or is it discussed in the previous lecture? Um, it's not obvious. Um, I don't think we've discussed it um, much. Um, I will basically, when you have a unipotent group, the forgetful functor is fully faithful. Um, and I think at some point today, I'll explain a little bit more why that's the case. Um, and once you know that fact, that's, that, that is not difficult. So for a unipotent group, the forgetful functor is fully faithful. Uh, And remember, so the fun calculation was that this sheaf has no cohomology whatsoever. Um, if somebody wants me to, so I, I hope you have fresh in, reasonably fresh in your mind what this sheaf is. If not, complain and I'll go over it in a little, more de little bit more detail. Uh, okay, so we have this sheaf and now what we can do is make it N equivariant. And the claim is that this is the same thing as what happens when we make it um, N equivariant in the other way, using the other averaging functor. And miraculously, we get TS. So this is a beautiful geometric construction of this missing perverse sheaf, but note that it's a rather more complicated than the other constructions we need. For example, it depends on these two cho these, the choice of these two other points, okay? And potentially we can imagine moving these points around and things like that. And um, that is in fact very um, useful thing to do. So why is this true? So proof of claim, I'll outline the proof. So let J be the inclusion of um, So this is the N orbit. infinity. 
now. Um, another thing that these averaging functors do is they commute with any um, n equivariant inclusion. And so um, j upper star of the averaging of n star of this thing. is isomorphic to the averaging over n star of um, j upper star of q x shriek y star. So the picture here So here I have C infinity, and this is a unique, this is an, this is an N orbit. And so this will end up being, so this is a, an N equivariant Chief on C, so it's just, um, so it's like a C equivariant sheaf on C, so it's just determined by global sections. So it's an N equivariant sheaf on N, so it's the equivalent to a, just a vector space on a point. And now, um, uh, so we have exercise, which is essentially immediate from the calculation, from the fun calculation last time, is that HI of C infinity with coefficients in this sheaf is C if I equals zero, is if I equals minus one and zero otherwise. Um, and so we deduce that this is in fact Q on, um, on this open cell. So what I'm saying is that whatever this induction is, it's restriction to the open cell um, is just a um, one dimensional trivial local system shifted so as to be perverse. Um, Jordi, yes? I have a question about how we should think about this isomorphism. Um, so if, if one had an open inclusion and a local system on the open subset where, the, where then the J lower, you know, J lower she equals J lower star, then that would mean that your local system is extending by zero to a perverse sheaf, right? So that's sort of a clean extension. So that's how one can think of it if it was an open inclusion from a local system. But I'm wondering if there's a sort of intuitive way of thinking about a sheaf satisfying this kind of property when the map is not inclusion, but more complicated, like averaging. Oh. Oh, you're asking how to, how to think about the fact that these two averaging functors are equal? Yeah. What I, I mean, my way of thinking about it is like, um, one, one is, one, like, it's a little bit like a sheaf that, a perverse sheaf that only has middle cohomology. Um, so, like, if you imagine taking um, pi, lo pi lower star to a point, then if I have a perverse sheaf, then art and vanishing, like, hmm. yeah, maybe, like, yeah, maybe it's best if I just say, because I don't have a really good way of thinking about this, but th I, I think a, one way of thinking about this is just that, kind of, um, there's only middle cohomology. Uh -huh. 
And a, a sort of not very important question, but is there a name for these sheaves that when you stick them in, you get an isomorphism between shriek and star? Is this like something blah, 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 AC click? Um, just want to know if that's some word that I can recognize. I don't know one. Um, okay. Maybe someone else does. Yeah, and I mean, you definitely should think about this as being remarkable. Like your analogy with clean is is pretty good, I think, in the sense that it's a very strong property that's very often not satisfied. And my vague memory is, um, and maybe you're going to say this later, my vague memory is that if you take this averaging, uh, but instead of putting the trivial sheaf on N, you put the non-trivial sheaf, then, then it's actually always an isomorphism. So instead of putting the trivial sheet, put the whatever yeah, right. non-degenerate character. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I will maybe get to this um, if I remember to say it. Yeah, there's a lot to remember to say today, but yeah. Um, and also, Masood reminded me, uh, um, you should, like, at the, in, a, in a little while, we'll see the art and try a sheaf. And... Somehow you can think about this sheaf as being some kind of variant of the art and trier sheaf. Um, and so often if you're trying to work out how to do something with an art and trier, you can do it with this sheaf first, use your intuition from the classical topology, and then go to the art and trier world. Um, okay, so we know that whatever this sheaf is on the open orbit, it's just a perverse, trivial um, rank one perverse sheaf. So now, uh, step two. Codomain of... Probably there's another mistake. Missing shift. Thank you very much, Tony. Step two. Uh, so we use the adjunction. So we say home from Q0. So I always allow myself to, uh, I'm experimenting with a new rule for sheaves this year, which is that whenever I have a sheaf supported on a closed subset, and, I, and that's canonically a subset of something bigger, I'm allowed to write that sheaf without writing extension by zero. That's the current rules that I'm operating under. Um, average n star, q x streak y star, one is by the adjunction hom from q zero. Remember there's this shift in the adjunction two q x y star one and now we can shift by two and now using the fact that x is x and y are non-zero this is q if i equals zero and zero otherwise. I'm using the fact that I up a shriek of a constant sheaf is a constant sheaf shifted up by two. Uh, okay, so now step, um, step three is that this averaging n star q x y star one is definitely in p d less than or equal to zero but steps one and two show it's also in p d bigger than or equal to zero so this implies that the averaging n star
is actually perverse. Uh, and now, um, step four. So this is where, this is maybe not the best argument. We can write, so, We can certainly write this as I see identity a number of times plus plus P TS a number of times. Okay, so we, we, we already know how many indecomposable perverse sheaves there are. And so there's five of them. And so we can certainly find a decomposition but now, one of the properties of this averaging functor is that it doesn't change global cohomology. So we have the, the cohomology of the averaging applied to this guy. Is up to a shift. Just the same thing as the cohomology Y star, and this is zero by the fun calculation last time. Or maybe not last time. Um, so, and now these all, all of these have cohomology. So none of them can occur. So this implies that only TS can occur. And we can now use either step one or step two. Implies that we get one copy. Okay. Uh, and uh, I mean, one thing that's really beautiful in this example is that we see that the dual of the averaging n star of q x shriek y star is isomorphic to the dual, sorry, the shriek averaging of the dual of Q X star Y, X shriek Y star, which is the averaging N, N shriek of Q X star Y shriek. And now this is isomorphic to um, so no matter how we how we um, how we choose our points, we get the same sheaf because there's a continuous choice of points and a and a discontinuous choice of isomorphism classes. Um, and so. And so then you can use this to show that the um, averaging of the shriek and star averaging agree, etc. And you can also show that um, that in fact the configuration space of um, of two points in C actually maps to the endomorphism. The, sorry, pi one of the configuration space of two points in C maps to the endomorphism ring of this um, projective, and that's very significant. Um, can. So is this the action of the braid group that you were talking about before? Exactly. From pi one 
I mean, I just find this so, um, so beautiful of C to the endomorphisms of TS. And this is a famous action. Um, so sadly, Professor Vilonen is not here with us today, but I just want to give you another take on this. It's not really relevant, but I just like it so much, um, I feel like more people should know about it. Um, so this is yet another construction. Uh, this was um, learnt. So somehow when you first meet this big projective, it seems like um, it's this, just this kind of algebraic thing, but then you, you meet these very rich geometric constructions and then you start thinking that it's actually more geometric than the original things in some sense. So if we look at the egg diagram or the, the composition series of X shriek Y star, it looks like the following. So we have IC of P1 in the middle and then we have a skyscraper at X at the bottom and a skyscraper at Y at the top. Now we might dream that we can let X and Y approach zero and get IC zero, IC P one, IC zero, which is exactly the big projective or the tilting sheet. Okay, so this is the rough idea. Again, it's kind of obvious um, if someone tells you, but I never would have thought of this. I think it's really nice. Um, so how do we formalize to taking a limit? So, if anyone can tell me, I will get you an ice cream wherever we next meet, if it's possible to buy an ice cream. How do we make, the answer is uh, nearby cycles. So nearby cycles do many things for you, but one of the things that is very useful is this notion of like of being able to take it if i have a family of sheaves over the disc nearby cycles is re you can really think of them as being a limit and we see this very explicitly in this example so i'll just go over this very uh, quickly so we take p1 times c and this maps down to c and now we have two loci inside here we have a kind of the, we have the diagonal of the slightly truncated diagonal and we have the uh, what i'll call z and i hope it's clear what these loci are we define f to be J lower shriek of the constant sheaf on P1 times C without this diagonal tensored tensored with J star Z, Q, P1 times C without Z. And so note, if I take F and I restrict it to P1 times 
x. Then this is exactly my x shriek zero star sheaf, but shifted by one. So it's like a kind of um, a family of Q X streak zero star for X varying. And then uh, exercise is that the nearby cycles of F is exactly TS. This exercise is not difficult. Um, for example, that you know, always know that the nearby cycles has the same cohomology as a nearby fiber. And so this thing has zero cohomology and it's perverse. So it has to be a number of copies of the tilting sheaf. And then you just have to work out that there's only one of them, which you can do at a generic point. Oh, so in the notes, I said beautiful exercise. And I do believe it's a beautiful exercise. So lightning intro to Whittaker world. Uh, so just for a moment, I want to take N B, G, um, finite groups of Lie type. So this should, G should be a split group of Lie type. And I really think that these are finite groups of Lie type. Um, so we take a character. And if V is a um, a representation of G, we can consider the space of Whittaker vectors. So these are those V such that N dot V is chi N dot V for all N in N. And this, of course, by, by Frobenius reciprocity, this is telling us, is this representation, to what extent is this representation seen by um, an induction from N of a, of a character? Now, uh, so there's an enormous amount that one can say say in this world, but I just want to uh, highlight one thing that is very useful for me. Suppose that V is the functions on a G set. For X a G set. Uh, what do Whittaker vectors look like? So in order to do this, I want to consider um, U in X an N orbit. So this is a fix an N orbit. And so this will be isomorphic to N mod K for some for some subgroup inside N. And uh, maybe, um, so functions on U is the same thing as um, it's the same thing as the induction from K to N 
of the trivial module. And it's the same thing as um, if we apply, so that it's the irreducible characters of N, so V lambda tensor V lambda dual, where we take K fixed points on the right hand side. And so this implies So over here, there is a unique um, irreducible that's one dimensional that corresponds to our chi. And so this over here, we see that this is either present or absent, depend, it's either present or absent basically. Um, and it's present or absent depending on whether um, K vanishes on, um, chi or not. So, um, is um, C Um, anyway, I'm sure the consequence is correct, either zero or one. Um, we take a vector per orbit. Maybe just a small subtlety for later is that if you are looking at the geometric situation, then you need to chi to be trivial on the component group like there's some issue with component group in the geometric world but for function world that you're looking at it's I think this is correct so roughly speaking I, we want that the Oh yeah, no, it does look correct. Okay. So basically speaking, um, if, if let, let's assume that chi is interesting. So this is forcing K to be small, this condition that it's trivial on K. Um, and so only big N orbits will support Whittaker, Whittaker vectors. Um, so I'll put that as a big orbits. Okay, so I'm reasonably confident this is correct now. Okay, so um, an important exercise, very important exercise. is that if X is G mod B um, and we, we consider Whittaker vectors with respect to N minus, so N minus mod its commutator is isomorphic to a direct sum of additive groups indexed by simple reflections. And now we have our character and this determines I inside simple reflections via I is those S alpha such that K 
chi is non-trivial on FQ alpha. Okay, so we have our chi here to C star. And we can ask which of these simple root vectors is it non-trivial on? And now show, so this is the important exercise that I really recommend you do, is that n minus x b mod b supports a non-zero Whittaker vector if and only if x is minimal. So an example, if chi is non-degenerate, So this, this is the same thing as saying it's non-trivial on each of these root subspaces. So I is everything. This implies that um, the Whittaker vectors in the um, principal series representation is just spanned by C, it's just isomorphic to C. So this is um, unique. And this is supported on the open Bruja cell. Okay. So uh, it's time for a break. Um, there's no way I'm going to get to the end of this lecture, so um, I'll just take my time and people that are interested can read the notes.
Drew, do you have a question? Tell me. Um, I'm confused about this last thing that you've written. So if our character is non-degenerate, then um, WI is empty. So the minimal coset representative would be the identity, right? No, if, if chi is non-degenerate, then it's non-trivial on everything. So I is everything. I is S and WI is everything. Are you happy? Yes, the thing that's throwing me off is that this is, I, I would be happier if maximal coset representatives gave us the orbits that supported a Whitaker vector. Uh, so this would be the case if um, if I was using n and not n minus. Oh. The P one. And now the the n minus orbits look like. This and this. Mm -hmm. And you know, the only one that supports this, this one supports a Whittaker vector. And it's the one corresponding to the identity. But if we're using n plus, then the orbits would be like down here and then this. And so it would be S that supports a Whittaker vector. You're still taking a character of N, not N minus? No, I'm taking a character of whichever one I, you know, like if I'm doing N minus, then I'm taking a character of N minus. Like the character needs to correspond to the subgroup that I'm taking. Okay, so you should have an N minus on your character up here then? Because here you have Kai as a character of N. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Apologies, yeah. Okay. So now we want to categorify Whittaker functions. And why exactly we want to do that, um, I hope to explain in a moment, but let's just assume for the moment that we, we do want to do this. Um, so now I change settings and G, B, um, T and minus, et cetera, are over F Q bar. And we know, um, that fun xn, so n equivariant functions is categorified by n equivariant sheaves. And now what we want to kind of answer is what categorifies, so fun x n chi is categorified by. So I first want to tell you the notation of the answer. And then I want to explain what this answer actually is. So um, firstly, Categor categorify our non-degenerate character chi. And here the answer is um, art and trier sheet.
And somehow to motivate this, um, I just want to remind you that if we take C and quotient out by Z, this is isomorphic to um, C star via Z goes to E to the X two pi I Z. And somehow the exponential function is the exponential function is the fundamental additive character. And so if we want to do this over a finite field, we can kind of imagine what does it mean to take the additive group and mod out by the integers, um, or more precisely, what does it mean to take A1 and mod out by FP? And then kind of the very strange thing that happens here is that this is just, we just get A1 back again, and this is via the Arten Schreier. X goes to X to the P minus X. So in some sense, you can think that um, this is something that's really specific to characteristic P, or you can think that it has an analog in char characteristic zero, but this analog, whereas this, so the Arten Schreier map um, is this, this composition. So the Art and Trier map in characteristic P, um, just kind of realizing this non-trivial additive char character, um, goes from this a space to itself. So it's a non-trivial covering of A1. And I think as we've discussed many times before, this has nothing to do with the fact that we're over a finite field. This is over the algebraic closure. So A1 is not simply connected in characteristic P. Uh, and if we denote this composition by a S, say A S lower star of Q L A one is isomorphic to a direct sum over the characters of the Galois group, which is in this case FP, chi from FP to Q L uh, star. L chi and generally we fix character um Chi, and we always deal with L chi. So I guess one way to think about these is, is these are, so these are character sheaves These are examples So these are sheaves on A1, which categorify the irreducible characters of the additive group. Okay, so now, um, yeah, and really, um, if I'm being honest, I should spend a, a lecture on this. Uh, but I won't. Um, so we now we do the following. We take n minus going to n minus mod. Sorry, Jody, can you show the bottom half of the top screen while you continue? Thank you. That's great.
So now um, we do an analogous situation. So now we kind of want to produce this, um, this irreducible character of our unipotent, but this should now be a, an irredu like a character sheaf. And so we define L to be P upper star of our fixed L chi. And now a very valuable exercise is that L chi and L are multiplicative. I.e. if we have the, I'll say it for N, N minus, if we consider the multiplication and we pull back L, then this is canonically isomorphic to L box L. And if you think about it, uh, this categorifies the fact that this is a group, th this is a one dimensional group homomorphism. Like a, this is sheaves on a group that satisfy this property and the, are the analogs of characters of your group. So now uh, we can define what it means to be N minus L equivalent. So How did I write this? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. And where um, F is a constructible complex on X and so N minus is acting on X and beta is an isomorphism between uh, the action map and L box F where A is the action map. Satisfying co-cycle condition. And then we get the category of N N minus L equivariant sheaves. So, as earlier, we have averaging L from DBC of X to DB N minus L of X um, given by M lower star of question mark of L box shifted by dimension of N minus, etc. And we have the same adjunctions as earlier. Uh, and we have our And then the kind of most important fact is that the forgetful functor
is fully faithful. Okay, so being n minus L equivariant is a property. And moreover, you get a kind of decomposition of this category in terms of the images of these categories. So um, you get something akin to a block decomposition where um, n minus L and n minus L prime equivariant things cannot speak to each other whatsoever. Okay, this is... Excuse me. Uh, yes, I have a question. So uh, when you define uh, the uh, D uh, uh, minus L, uh, you said uh, that, uh, this is the category of uh, uh, N minus L uh, equivalent sheaf. So the, those pairs, but you, 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 you didn't really define uh, what uh, the morphisms in, in this category are. Yeah, so, so these, they, these are um, morphisms commuting with, so... Uh, Yeah. But somehow we uh, somehow we can prove that uh, yes, any morphism automatically commutes with beta. Yeah, so that, that's my, my question. Thank exactly. You. Yeah. Which is I, I don't know, I find it somewhat non-intuitive, um, but um, somehow once you get used to this fact Uh, I'm running out of time massively anyway. So the, the following exercise, um, I said I probably won't give, but now because I, there's no way I'll get to the end, um, I'll give it anyway. Be I really like it and I thought it was sad not to give it. So just as... Um, exercise. So Jordi, can mm -hmm. we have a look at your previous page for a sec? Is the following way of thinking about the fact that things commute with beta correct? So in a sense, beta, because our group is connected, et cetera, and unipotent, beta is essentially unique once you fix maybe at, at, at E, like the identity element, what happens. And then if you try to commute past something with it, then you get a new isomorphism, which by uniqueness will have to be equal to this. Probably a decent way of thinking about it, yeah. Uh, okay, so we have this Art and Trier map. And for the younger members of the audience, please um, try to do this exercise at some point. I mean, particularly if your thesis involves um, Iwahori Whitaker things. Um, so, part A, Um, show explicitly that uh, I was calling it Art and Trier, I think, before, extends to P1. Okay, that means really find a formula for this extension. B, um, this is an informal exercise, so let's call it A prime. Show, so let's call this map A prime. Show that 
A prime breaks all the rules you know, coverings of Riemann surfaces. Okay, so this, this thing certainly does not lift a characteristic zero. Um, so this is the simplest example. Um, a prime at infinity is the simplest example of wild, so-called wild ramification. Um, B, show that the canonical map from L, so we have this sum and show that this is an isomorphism. C, show that the cohomology with values in L chi is zero. So thus L chi is a bit like and D show that J shriek L chi is um, n minus L chi equivariant. So I'm not really a, a super expert on how to think about this um, this L chi, but roughly roughly speaking, I think about it as a really beautiful local system everywhere here, and then some really wild stuff happens at infinity. And the fact that it's kind of nice on this bit is expressed by this um, L, n minus L chi equivariance. And then uh, E is um, to connect with the fun exercise earlier. If we average this, we get the indecomposable tilting sheaf. Okay. And this is actually important in Archipop, this is important in Archipop Ezra Kavnikov, this fact. Okay, so now I'll start a bird's eye view of the rest of the proof. Um, and we'll see how far I get. Are there any qu more questions based on this? Okay, so bird's eye view of the rest of the proof. Uh, so we have G and we have the affine flag variety. And now we have the um, Iwahori. And it's opposite. Um, we also have um, NK minus and NK plus. And NK minus you can think of as being just strictly lower triangular matrices with arbitrary entries. 
So we have seen that M antispherical, this antispherical module has a realization as H mod Bx where X is not minimal. Okay. So this should, so we've seen this and this is a kind of useful constructible point of view on things. But we have another realization which is important in periodic groups. Which is that M antispherical can be realized as the Whittaker vectors in the principal series. So um, NK minus. Now I want to use a different chi. So Whittaker vectors. So we might hope, so I'm, I'm not an expert on the subject, but as I understand it, this is actually where the name antispherical comes from. Um, this, or maybe not, I'm not sure. Yeah, anyway, but this, this, this realization is very important. And we might hope that M antispherical could be realized as NK minus Xi equivariant cheese on the flag variety. But the problem is the NK minus orbits are uh, infinity over two dimensional. And by that I mean that they're not neither a finite dimension nor co-dimension. That kind of people often call these the semi-infinite orbits. So uh Jordi, is there an intuitive way of thinking about this isomorphism in red? Like is there a philosophical reason we should believe in this or um i think it's very if you if you look at um what i said with the orbits before which orbits support a Whittaker vector um it's easy to see that the orbits are precisely the the orbits that support a weight lattice a, a Whittaker vector are precisely the um orbits through um co-weights i think so all I'm saying is it's, it's pretty immediate that this thing has the right size. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know beyond that if there's an intuitive way of seeing this. Like to see that the module structure is correct, um, I'm not sure. But I would love to know if someone else. Um, and this makes sheaf theory tricky. Uh, and there's one solution, which is to use um, Grinfeld compactification. And this is pursued in uh, Frankel, Gates, Gree, Villon, and uh, Whittaker patterns.
but this is not understood by me. Um, and it's not the point of view that um, Roman takes. So another solution And from, from what I understand, uh, people uh, like Gates Green now have a, 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 a way of thinking about this that makes complete formal sense and can, you can work with. Um, I'm just not aware of the right way to think about this. Okay. So this makes sheaf theory tricky if your conception of thief, sheaf theory was formulated in the 70s, 80s and 90s, as mine was. Um, Another solution is so-called um, Iwahori Whitaker. So this is uh, Roman's name for it, and um, Dennis calls this baby Whitaker. Um, and the idea is to replace I, sorry, N, K minus by I, U minus. So roughly speaking, uh, how I understand this is that when we look at this function space, we're looking at a, a very big congruent subgroup to define it. And so even though if we were looking at general um, admissible representations, we would really need this kind of full Whittaker, but because we're looking at a very restricted class of admissible re representations, representations that admit a fixed vector under a very big um, open subgroup, we're allowed to mess with our Whittaker, with our um, group that we take Whittaker vectors under, and we're allowed to replace this complicated guy by this much easier guy. And the crucial lemma, um, which is, I'm not sure if it's um, due to Akipov Bezra Kamnikov, but if we take that these two function spaces are canonically the same. So this is what we want to build. And this is isomorphic to something that we can build. And the point, um, the point is that the IU minus orbits on the flag righty are simply opposite Bruja cells. Okay. Rudy, I have a question. Sure. I think, I think I missed a definition. What is phi? Phi. Or psi. The, your red box, the character. Ah. Um, I'm just saying, like, Basically, it is a it is a non-degenerate character of this n k minus. Okay. Um, given by. Yeah, I mean it's given by a formula. I don't want to go into the formula of it. Um, and. But it's some specific character. It's a some specific character. Yeah. And a non-degenerate characters are all conjugate. So, take whichever one you want. In the affine case, is this still okay? I, I think so. Because what we're saying here is that it's still, um, I mean, in this case, this, there's nothing affine about this psi. But in the Iwahori one, it is affine. So there's a, there's a funny difference between this psi and chi. And what is chi? Chi depends on psi somehow? Mm, well. Chi is just 
this, this is just non-degenerate and what Masu, like th th this is just non-degenerate and there's no subtlety. I mean, I mean, I would, I would agree that there's no, um, like you're saying that there's nothing affine here. And I no, would agree. in the group, yes, but not in the character in some sense. Like, I mean, the group also is like K points of a finite uh, algebraic group, right? This N is just the usual N and we're just yeah. taking K points of it. Yes. So therefore N divided by its, uh, uh, now think about N and divided by its commutator. I'm confused. I, the N is something infinite, right? Isn't the N really large? Well, N K is large, but N is not large. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, but K, so, so this is now isomorphic to a product over C T. Yes. Of additive groups. And the product is over finite simple roots. Over finite simple roots, yeah. And so again, everything is conjugate. All the non-degenerate ca characters are conjugate over the torus over TK. But there's an additional... Ah, okay. And now we want a character from here to something like C star. And you're saying that they're still... Well, I'm still confused here. Like for GL2, isn't N, NK completely abelian? Yes. yes. So this, it's not, uh, it's, a, it's, it's much bigger than this, right? This quotient by the commutator. Commutator is zero. Yes. Um, it's not bigger. It's just literally a copy of the... One, one, zero star. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see what you're But like on, I think this is kind of false for chaotic groups. I'm not sure. Like, um... No, that's, I think it's the same. Um, what's... Different is when you go to Iwahori and you do the same thing, you get a product over the affine simple roots. So you get one extra one. Yeah, but we get FQs here rather than we get. Yeah, well, we get FQs. FQs here rather than FQTs. I think the thing is not, like, not everything in FQT is a square. Isn't that kind of a problem? If you want everything to be conjugate. Uh, yeah, I have to say I'm also a little suspicious that they're all conjugate, but... So, Jordi, if you go back to previous uh, slide, I just wanted to make a comment, just right here, I want to make a comment I learned from Pramod two and a half years ago in Sydney. So, um, if you look at NK, so, you know, these lower triangular things are all Laurent series, right? And if you think about the Laurent series is, has two parts, the positive part and the negative part. So it consists of two power series, okay? And the negative part is a finite power series. So it's a polynomial, but let's just, so it has these two parts. Now, if you think about separating the two parts and bring the positive part to the, above, uh, to the top right corner, which is right now zero, and keeping the negative parts in the bottom right corner, then you get I minus. So this going from NK minus to I minus is literally separating your um, power series, your Laurent series into a power series and a polynomial and putting them on two different sides. And somehow miraculously this works um, in a sense that when you take averaging, uh, there's averaging functor that um, gives you an isomorphism of function spaces. Did that make at all any sense? Like, it, are you just saying that the like the Iwahori, the Iwahori and the N for something like GL two are isomorphic in some sense, like in as, some like, weird sense, right? They're not isomorphic as a group, but they sort of have the same number of elements. You know, it's a. Um, let's ignore the torus maybe for a second. Mm -hmm. Let's be thinking about lower and upper triangular things, in the I minus. Mm -hmm. and put them all together, it's like the same size as N minus. Um, okay, I have to think. Um, I'm 
Okay, so this is great. So we can um, we can make a definition. So we have uh, D Iwahori Whitaker. So, uh, so do, uh, have you ex already explained? So, so uh, chi is just any non-degenerate character, or chi is just any non-degenerate character? Yeah. Yeah, but as we discussed, it the they might not be conjugated to each other, each, each other. The question was if this is unique. Yeah. Uh, up to conjugacy. Th this, this I claim is always unique up to conjugacy by the same argument oh, as okay. the finite case. And now the um, here, the irreducible objects are I C X L chi for X a minimal coset representative. Okay, this this is follows from the same essentially the same ex exercise before about which Bruja cells support a Whittaker function. Um, the the Bruja cells that support an irreducible Whittaker object, Iwahori Whittaker object, are those corresponding to minimal coset representatives. And this already looks rather promising from, um, from a combinatorial perspective because we want to relate this to the antispherical module. So uh, I'll just summarize with one more page. Um, so where we left off last time. We have this functa um, after an enormous amount of effort, we func we described this functor from Koji and tilde to D I. So this is I equivariant cheese on the flag variety. And this was induced by a functor co free G check and tilde to PI that sends V tensor O to the central functor applied to the Satake of V and sends O lambda to J lambda. So this was a central sheaf and this is a Wakimoto sheaf. And we had our model for the antispherical module, which is equivariant perverse sheaves modulo ICX And the main theorem, so theorem one in Aki Popes Rukavnikov is that F tilde induces an equivalence between DB co G check and tilde and this quotient. Okay. But like I'm not really sure why this why the proof works, but I think that one thing to keep in mind is that this is just a quotient and somehow we don't know very much about this. Um, and so we use the Iwahori Whitaker business to attempt to understand this. So that's what I want to go through um, briefly now and then we'll stop. So we have this averaging functor which goes from PI to 
P iwa hori witika. Um, so it's not obvious that it's exact, but it is. And now it's it's um, relatively easy to see that this factors over that it that this averaging kills all ICs that don't correspond to minimal. So this factors over. I will write it like this. This averaging. So now we get this is what we want to show as an equivalence to FPI. And now we have this averaging functor to Iwahori Whitaker, very derived category, derived category. And then we have this um, realization functor to D. And then we denote the composition by F. This is averaging. Now, the main theorems, so the, the kind of auxiliary theorems, so basically, all of these arrows will eventually be equivalences. So A is that um, FPI is equivalent via this averaging functor to Iwahori Whitaker. B, so this tells us that a tells us that this is an equivalence. Um, B is that DB of P Iwahori Whitaker is equivalent via the realization functor to D Iwahori Whitaker. And C is that um, F Iwahori Whitaker is an equivalence. So this is A here, so this is an equivalence, this is B, and this is C. And then that implies, at the end of the day, this is the theorem here. Okay. So I just want to say a few words. Um, this, is, this is pretty standard. So in Anna's notes, this is corollary 20.12 or, or a very similar, um, a very similar um, argument. This is the fact that we basically, we have an affine stratified variety, etc. cetera. Um, a, this is a um, easy consequence of C. So this is where the work is. Uh, and yeah, maybe, uh, so what's the kind of main point of the proof is that we just don't know enough about this one. And somehow in this world, we have highest weight structures and things like that, and we can hope to compute Holmes. And so that's why it's easier to check that this arrow is, um, is an equivalence. Uh, and a very important role is played by um, the functor. So here we have the functor of restricting to the open to regular nilpotent orbit. And it turns out that there's a beautiful realization of this functor here. 
So if you'd like to know a little bit more about this, see the notes. And if you'd like to know a lot more about this, see Archibald Bezrakovnikov. Um, so in the next lectures, I'll now assume that this theorem is proved.